Okay, I thought I'd do a redo or a makeup, an update video. I tried to take the uh, criticism seriously and maybe sometimes I overreact because I'm so accustomed to having to fight naysayers. So um, I'm sorry if I offend anyone or chase anybody away. I didn't intend that. But I took the criticism seriously from a fellow who was saying that it's not buildable. And yeah, I kind of knew that. Um, but the simulation is just meant to suggest what is possible. But of course, you have to work the simulation to know um, how much wiggle room you have and where do you have it. And since you guys haven't worked it, you're not familiar with the circuit, so how could you know? But since I've kept working on it, I kind of know where the wiggle room is. And there's a lot of wiggle room. So it's not intended to be taken literally except on a couple points. One is... The frequency, 300 gigahertz, that's what 3e e to the 11 represents. That's serious business. This circuit, as it is configured, in, you know, in a broad sense, will not kick into gear unless you hit a minimum of 300 gigahertz. Now, I don't know, I only tested 200 and 400, so maybe there's something between 200 and 300 that's the turning point. But you can go above 300 gigahertz and you'll just get... Um, an escalation, or I should say an acceleration, of voltage buildup in less time. So the frequency, the increase of frequency, um, in, in, enhances performance per unit time. But that's provided you hit the turning point. If you don't hit the turning point, then it just kind of sits there and doesn't do much of anything. Now, every circuit is different when you're dealing with electrical reactance enhancement, you know, recycling or enhancement via electrical reactants. In this particular case, the frequency has to be very high. You know, I've had circuits as low as 13 hertz. Oh no, excuse me, 13 kilohertz. Um, no, I even had one circuit as low as 10 hertz because it was overreacting way too much, but it was an artificial version of this circuit in which instead of negative res resistance um, being provided by a neon bulb style spark gap, uh, in parallel with a capacitor, I had um, internally had told the simulator to put negative resistance in parallel with e each of these capacitors in the LMD module, top and bottom. And so it naturally functioned very well. It was very idealistically perfect. But of course, it's not buildable. So this is a digression from that, an attempt to scale it down, which is what I was doing. I was trying to scale it down because you can get over Unity anyway from Eric Dollar's analog computer. It, you just have to make massive um, capacitances and massive inductances in order to accommodate the only way to create over unity. But it will be done, and it's very irregular and not regulatable, but anyway, be that as it, well, no, it is regulatable in a sense, but the waveforms are very randomized and spiky. No, I learned a trick to m regulate is to control the mutual inductance between the coils separating the modules. If you reduce that sufficiently enough, you know, by sliding the coils apart, sliding out the iron core, whatever it takes, you can vary the outcome. And you can even stall the thing and get it to stall. Or you can change the input frequency. But that's provided you continue to um, feed it an input frequency. Now, I had previously a snap switch that snapped very fast one femtosecond and who can build something like that you know so I thought about it you know okay so I took out all the switches and um, I put a capacitor at the tail end of the, of the uh, voltage source and I changed the voltage source from a sine wave generator to a radio tuner not that it really matters excuse me <clears throat> technically it doesn't matter what matters is that you don't overdo the voltage input now you can go as high as I've taken it as high as 12 volts input um, so that's not a problem. You don't have to use one microvolt. You just enhance it and get better results if you feed it less voltage. Now you can't feed it too little, like uh, uh, one Yocto volt, you know, is not going to work. I've tried that. But one microvolt is the kind of workable minimum, and around 10 volts is the workable maximum. So you can't feed it the full voltage you can that you normally feed um, our electric car motors 
from the battery pack, you know, 300 volts or thereabouts, or, or 200 volts, no, uh -uh. that'll suppress electrical reactants, you don't want to do that. You want to keep your voltage low, so that you can get this electrical reactants to occur, you want to encourage it. Now, there is a technique, you can use voltage division, and leak off um, excess voltage with a very strong resistor, you know, like 100 mega ohms, if you feel the need to feed at 12 volts using a sine wave generator, um, actually though a sine wave generator outputs, uh, the digital kind outputs 3 volts, and you have to feed it uh, between 9 and 12 volts, although 12 volts is better than 9, you get a better waveform that way. So although you feed it 12 volts, the output into the circuit will be 3 volts, and that's not bad, but if that's too much, you can always bleed it off with a voltage division. Uh, it may seem like a waste, but now I'm learning that taught me something. I took that away because I don't need to have it. What I learned is put the load where the source is because that's where all the buildup is happening. Why leak it out anywhere else when I want to build up the voltage everywhere else? So why not just leak it in the same place that it's going to leak anyway because I no longer have a switch here, okay? So now that I don't have a switch here, I can put the load here and bleed out my voltage through the voltage source. Now, what does that do? You have to make sure your voltage source can handle all of this energy rushing past it because it's going to be a lot of backwash of energy running past your voltage source. In the beginning, it's beautiful little triangle waves and the current portion of the triangle wave and the voltage portion are in step, zero degrees phase relation between them. It's perfect. It shows me that capacitance is ringing in this circuit, not inductance. So, you know, everybody goes for the small fry. I always go for the big fry, and I learned capacitors are the way to do it. That's where you get your energy gain that's very explosive, is through capacitance, electrical capacitance, elect, um, capacitive reactance, not inductive reactance. Inductive reactance is kind of lame, but in my opinion. You don't get that explosive surge of energy as you would with capacitive reactance. Now, with capacitive reactance, you don't get sine wave um, reacting back at you because you, you, that's not dominating. What's dominating are the capacitances of the circuit and so you get triangle waves coming back at you and they're in lockstep. The current and the voltage are in lockstep. Then you really know you're doing something awesome. So I put all the loads here and the current on all these loads are the same except for, of course for the inductor which is always delayed. So the capacitive load, the resistive load is slightly more than the capacitive load. Even though the capacitive load I have 10 farads, resistive load I have 1,000 ohms. Um, on the inductive load, I always put an equivalent series resistance to the Henry's. Because I learned if you have a 25 uh, gauge, 25 AUG, 25 AWG gauge wire, uh, magnetic winding wire, it tends to have internal simple resistance, series resistance, uh, about equivalent to um, the inductance of the coil. So I just make it one-to-one -one and then I'm assuming, you know, you're going to use a, a, a way, uh, I, I'm assuming a, a wire gauge similar or close to 25 AUG. Not that you have to use that, you know. Um, what else? Now in the beginning, I've, I don't have the graphics, on, unfortunately, to show you. I'll collect them when I get done polishing this up. But I've already done it before and I've noticed that y you have to simulate this um, since it's since the minimum is 300 gigahertz you have to simulate this slightly more than the inverse of that to, to be able to see three periods of the sine wave coming out of this voltage source. And then when you look at neighboring components that's when you see the triangle waves neatly forming and they're growing in amplitude. And that tells you that everything is working perfectly. The uh, circuit is amassing uh, voltage and amperage and it's having an impact backwashing on these components adjacent to the voltage source. Later on, as you proceed forward in time, the voltage and current buildup from in here starts to become randomized and then you start getting random spikes. Um, so that's not nice triangle waves, but in the beginning it's triangle waves. And when I had no spark gaps here, and I just had parallel negative resistance in these caps in each mod LMD module, I was getting only triangle waves on all my components everywhere throughout the circuit,
and everything in lockstep current lockstep with voltage. So I had an ideal case to use as my target, my goal, my ideal case that I wanted to steer towards to try to replicate. But I also have to make it buildable. So instead of a sine wave generator worrying about the current that's going to show up here and probably destroy the sine wave generator, I decided to go with a radio tuner. And the radio tuner has to be a simple tuner. No complicated amplification whatsoever, more along the lines of a crystal radio set. Very simple. And you want to tune it, it, it should be able to tune to a minimum of 300 gigahertz or more. So it doesn't have to be fine tuned and it does not have to work, you don't have to worry about drift. You, just so long as you don't drift below 300 gigahertz. So you obviously you're going to want to target above 3 gigahertz to allow for drift. Okay, and you might want to put in a simple device that's not too complicated that maybe can hold on to, uh, uh, you know, prohibit drift to a certain degree, but not make it too complicated because you're going to get a lot of the amperage and voltage, whoops, building up, backwashing, building up in here, and then backwashing out because this is now your drain, and this is where all your current is going to drain to give you the possibility for locating a load because you don't want to locate the load anywhere within the circuit because that's going to kill your circuit. Not so much on the ends, so much as in the two interior modules. You know, there are two exterior modules, so there's four all together, but those are not a full LMD module because they're not making use of transformers and they're not adjacent to another module. See, when two modules are adjacent to each other, that's where you get the kick and you only need two because actually if you try three, it doesn't work. So you have two core modules that are the true LMD analog computer modules of Eric Dollard's analog computer. And anything outside of that is just a way to bookend it. That's the way I, 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 I um, <laughs> like to describe it. You, you have to put two bookends on. I mean, you're going to have to anyway. Um, now, if you, I have in the past in Paul Falstad's simulator used only one coil of a transformer coil. So you could potentially no, but see, I'm feeding outside the two core modules, and that's important. So I'm feeding the input outside, and I'm taking the output off of outside the two uh, core modules. And so that's why I have these two bookend modules on either side to make four modules all together. And the buildup of voltage is greater in the two core modules than on the two bookend modules. So it is good to have these bookend modules as a buffer between... Uh, your input and your output, uh, for starters. But you don't touch anything. Nothing in here is your load. So you don't apply any load to anything within any of the four modules. All your load has to be taken off of this four module system or energy coming in to get it started in the first place. And since we don't have a switch to turn it off, it's continuous. So I have a simple radio tuner so I don't have to worry about what voltage I'm using, and I'm not inputting any voltage. I'm not providing it. I get it from my environment at one microvolt. That's where I got the one microvolt in the first place. I looked up how much voltage can you get from a whip antenna of three feet in length, okay? One yard, one meter uh, piece of wire that a crystal radio set from the 1920s normally would employ as its aerial. It would be, uh, you'd tape it up to your wall above your radio. Your simple Galena, you know, uh, diode style radio with maybe one coil to help you tune. Um, and so I found out it's roughly one microvolt. It's not exactly, but it's roughly. So I thought, okay, I'll base my circuit on that. Because everybody says, oh, energy from the air, you know, well, that's bullshit. <laughs> You're not using, obviously, energy from the air. You're just getting stimulus. The amount being provided is so small because you don't want to suppress the electrical reactants, so you really can't call it you're getting energy from the air. And But people have been misleading all the time. The Amon brothers claimed they were getting energy from the air. Well, it, it's so bogus. How much can you really get from the air? Come on. I mean, you would need a massive aerial system to be able to pick up sufficient voltage to amount to anything, and you don't need to. You use electrical reactants to recycle uh, um, reactive power and convert it into real power and then we can have all the energy we want to per unit time based on how much electrical reactants we recycle per unit time, the proportional amount. So we can feed it a microvolt and get away with it. 
So I never like to claim that I'm getting energy from the air because it's so bogus. I'm getting energy from energy is what I'm getting. Um, as it is, no energy moves around anyway. I'm like Joseph Newman. I, I believe energy c is, stays in the atom. It's in the atom and it stays in the atom. The only thing that transfers around in the circuit is information. And information is ephemeral. It has no material existence of its own, yet it has, to, like a parasite, it has to be hosted by matter and en energetic matter, such as copper atoms and so forth and, uh, you know, whatnot. But um, energy itself is ephemeral. It, it's non-existent. It's, it's information. It's a pattern that we recognize, like we see a ripple going across the surface of the water. You, the energy is not the water that's moving. The energy is in the water being made use of, manipulated by the information that's traveling across the lake that causes the ripples to occur in a certain timed fashion. And our brain is a pattern recognition organism that recognizes patterns when we see it. And then we impose those patterns and the complication is we impose our conclusion is, oh, energy's moving across the lake. No, it's not. Energy is erupting from the lake in a ripple movement fashion that can move objects along the surface of the water, like a leaf floating will move with the ripple. But that doesn't mean the energy is moving. Well, the only thing that's moving is information. So that's the way I strictly look at the situation because that's the way I see it. You look at a football stadium, people doing the wave, they're, they're waving their hands and standing up and down. They're, they're not moving side to side, yet from the opposite side of the stadium, it looks like a ripple is moving sideways across the grandstand on the opposite side. And so, yeah, it'll move objects. You, you do a mash, you know, a mosh or, or a mash, you know, like a rock uh, uh, stadium, you know, somebody leaps into everybody's arms and they move you along. Well, that's the peristaltic action of the intestines. That's the, the um, they have a fan made from piezoelectric crystals and little tiny hairs that move sideways in a vibratory fashion and it moves or, excuse me, it undulates. It looks like it's undulating from one side to the other, but it's really whipping up and down, and yet the ripples are patterned as a wave moving sideways, and so that moves the air molecules along sideways. So we look at these things, and see, I already slipped, because I'm programmed, like everybody else, to think in terms of waves as energy. No, they're not. They're information. That's all they are. And like Joseph Newman, I have to agree, minus the gyroscopic portion of his theory, just the fact that energy comes out of the copper atoms, and Tesla knew this. He knew that in theory you could have as much energy as you wanted, but in practice you can't. So he did tests to see how much he could get away with. He, he, he tried to blow up stuff, and he found his limits. How much, how far can he go b b before the dielectric of a capacitor, the, the voltage breaks through and destroys the dielectric? How, how far can you go before you blow up copper wire. Not just melt the insulation, I'm talking blowing up the copper atoms of the copper wire and turn it into um, microscopic fine particles of copper dust that is so microfine it won't even fall to the floor. It'll just hang there in the air and you sneeze and you'll blow it out the window. That's how microfine the explosion is. And that's what happened to 9-11, but I won't go there. That's a whole other topic in itself. <laughs> Uh, there's a forensic scientist who covered that uh, deal. But that's what happens with electrical reactants. You can blow up materials into such microfine particles that they can't even sink to the floor. They're so microfine. And that's the limit because the valence electrons of copper is holding it together. And so there's only so much energy you can pass through a copper wire before you exceed the balance of forces that are holding the copper atoms together at their valence electrons and the whole thing just blows apart. So that's way beyond melting the insulation, okay? So that's the physical limitation of free energy that you have to build into your circuit and plan on it. The theoretical limit is infinite per unit time. You can have as much as you want so long as you engineer for it and are ready to handle it. <laughs> so here I'm trying to make it buildable. And um, the other thing is, this circuit is so generic. See, notice you've got, um, you've got kilovolts on your node voltages, voltages here, but then it, over here it's gigavolts.
So obviously in the real world, you're going to get more resistance than what I'm getting in my simulation. So don't worry about that, okay? It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's still a little too idealistic despite my attempt to put in solder joints that are poor solder joints. I still can't compete with electrical reactants. This the, the capacitive electrical reactants is so efficient and this is what most people are not familiar with. They, they're used to inductive reactants. You know, back EMF, lie back transformer. Nice. Nothing wrong with it. But I go for the big stuff. Detonation. Explosion of energy. You know, what happens in dynamite when it explodes? I'm sure it's not inductive electrical reactants behind the chemistry of, a, of dynamite exploding. I'm sure it's capacitive electrical reactants that gives us that kick in the chemi chemistry of explosive bombs. You know, if you study electri the electrical um, behavior of the dynamite exploding, I'm sure it's capacitive electrical reactants, not inductive electrical reactants, because you really get a big kick out of capacitive variety of electrical reactants that you cannot get from inductive electrical reactants. So, enough of the soapboxing. So if you have a minimum frequency that you hit on this thing, whatever it happens to be, you start slow and work your way up, you'll hit that magic break over point, that tipping point, and then you can just take it higher if you like, but at least you hit your minimum. Now the same thing goes for the construction of this thing. You need a capac you need a spark gap of some kind or another, obviously not a neon bulb because that would could never withstand the high voltages and currents involved here. I just chose this because it's the only spark gap I could find in microcap. I can't find another one. In Paul Falstead's simulator, at least his spark gap, the default is a thousand volts breakdown voltage. Here it's, um, I think it's 90 or 100, I forget which, because LT Spice, either LT Spice or Microcap is 90 and the other one is 100. I forget which is which. But it's both the same. They're patterning their basic default um, spark gap on what they feel people are going to most likely utilize up front. But that's not going to withstand the rigor of this circuit. And trust me, these circuits, when you're dealing with capacitive electrical reactants, they stress themselves up their gazoo. And you have to be prepared for stress. For instance, the boiling of capacitors or the meltdown of coils. Um, not just ex things exploding, but things boiling, you know, short of exploding. So you're going to deal with stress, and you've got to handle that stress, all the heat buildup. This is an exothermic circuit. This is not an endothermic circuit. I wish it were then it could last a thousand years and without any maintenance issues. But this is an exothermic circuit that's going to overheat like nuts, and you're going to have to deal with that. Now, Richard Hackenberger, when he worked on the EV Gray motor, he didn't work with an AM radio nearby because he was just a strictly an electrical engineer, formally trained. He, never, he didn't need entertainment. He was focusing on the task at hand. Little did he know that he was creating radio interference, and that's what you're going to do with the circuit. You're going to get the FCC at your front door, and they're going to raid your place and take everything, including your desk chair, because that's what they did to Richard Hackenberger. Now, how did he solve the problem? He created a conversion, a thermodynamic conversion, f between the electrostatic charge building up and some of the electromagnetic, but mostly electrostatic. He encouraged the electrostatic, and I'm going to describe that in a minute, so that most of the excess energy turned into electrostatic rather than electromagnetic. And then he blew compressed air across it, and that ionized the air, removed the charge via the removal of the ions, and they would ground themselves out at nearby objects. So he was grounding out his electrostatic field, and he was converting as much as possible of his electromagnetic field into electrostatic field charge so that he could go through this two- or three-stage process of converting his excess energy into ionizable energy that could then easily ground itself out to nearby objects. He had to do that or else risk another FCC raid. And this solved a lot of problems. They, they stopped having to blow up batteries to get rid of their excess energy because they had a 300 to 1 coefficient of performance on their d system. Um, so what he did was he took the chassis of the EV Gray motor. It was a pulse DC motor. And he made certain it was made of aluminum. They had used Teflon chassis, but only for a short while because they realized they had to move to aluminum. Why? Because he was trying to create a floating plate capacitor plate. Okay, that was the floating part of the floating outer plate, but he had to go further than that. So he surrounded the aluminum chassis with nine bands of copper, 
copper strip, copper metal strip, going around the circumference of the drum shape chassis for that motor. Nine strips of copper all the way around. Not connected to anything. These are floating plates. These are the outer floating plate to, cre to create the outer floating charge. Now the inside of the aluminum chassis was coated with Teflon. And then he blew compressed air through the interior of the motor. For, now that's, but that's the dielectric, the moving dielectric of the air. But he had the stationary Teflon coating to the inside of the aluminum. That's also part of the dielectric of his floating uh, capacitor. And then he had the outer uh, floating plate, namely the aluminum chassis and the nine bands of copper surrounding that. Now he had to create an inner floating plate. And he did so, he already had the copper windings of the rotor coils and the motor coils. So to provide the aluminum on the inside, he had aluminum brackets supporting the rotor coils. And those aluminum brackets were isolated, electrically, conductively isolated from the rest of the device. So they were floating aluminum plates, just like the aluminum chassis was a floating plate. And thereby he had his floating plate capacitor to create the electrostatic conversion of whatever electromagnetic excess energy was creating a field, a very strong field around his device. He had to make sure he converted that to minimize radio interference in his local environment. So he converted his electromagnetic noise, his smog, into electrostatic noise and then converted the electrostatic noise into ionic particulate noise, if you can call it that, and move those particulate matter out of his device into the nearby environment and ground out the excess charge. We may have to do something sep different, uh, similar. Now when we go to the so-called Nikola Tesla electric car hoax article that's still up on Wikipedia, although they're discussing removing it, we, you know, the storyline from the 1930s, the Pierce Arrow electric car conversion, we just assume that the aerial on the back side was strictly for the gathering of energy that was exclusively powering the car. Well, this circuit uh, demonstrates that's not the way that works. Tr and then, on to top it off, there's so much backwash of energy that the aerial ends up being a ground for the excess energy. So now we've got this thing excuse me, broadcasting excess energy out at the, the so-called ground, which is now serving as an aerial because of a radio tuner. It's now a, a two-way aerial. It initiates the um, charging of this circuit with the right frequency of a sine wave to get it going. But once it gets going, it's self-feeding. And it just takes off to an infinite gain until it blows itself up unless we do something to correct that. And of course we know by reducing the mutual inductance of all three transformers of the four um, modules that we can regulate how well this thing functions and even turn it off. So that shouldn't be an issue. The issue will be we'll be putting out lots of uh, radio interference through our so-called aerial ground that we have to somehow deal with. And so when you think about it, in that, those days, he, he did the, air, the Pierce Arrow experiment three years before the FCC came into being which kind of made me wonder, and maybe that's, he's the reason why we have the FCC. And he drove the car up to 90 miles an hour. That means you've got 90 miles per hour wind blowing across the aerial. So now he's ionizing the air in a trail behind the car and leaving it behind the car. So I think what we would have to do is have a two-step system. We could have the aerial on the outside, but we can need another one on the inside of the car with a forced air intake, just like we normally do these days, blowing air through and out the back end to ionize a part of the aerial that's now internalized so that when you're sitting idling the car at a stationary position, at least you're blowing air across a portion of its bi or dual aerial. One aerial sticks up out of the car and one is internal that you're blowing air across it. Because we got to do whatever we can to minimize radio interference with our local environment and keep the FCC happy and keep all the radio hams ha happy too. How many radio hams want uh, radio interference? They'll, be ca they'll call up. They'll be the first ones to call the FCC. Hey, there's something going on in the neighborhood. Check it out. And they'll will, they will triangulate and find you and raid your place and take everything, including your socks. So we don't want to get the FCC unhappy. All right, enough of that. So... What we do is we build this up from scratch using small induct inductances on the coils, 
and small capacitances on the capacitors of the four modules. We start small and gradually build our way up to see what does it take to create the amount of energy we want to create because that's the part we can't that's the part we can change the part we can't not change is the minimum frequency to run this thing and the minimum voltage the you know the volt window of voltage we have to keep it down we can't feed it hundreds of volts or thousands of volts it won't work so we got to have a limit of 10 volts and a minimum of a microvolt to feed this thing but we can build the coils and capacitors marginally you know small and work our way up until we get to an energy level that suits our loads. And here's our load. I, I learned to put the resistive load here because then that blocks and cap, puts a cap, so to speak, a relativistic cap on the voltage buildup, preventing it from spilling out. So I only have a high voltage on one side of the inductor of 700 volts, yet on the opposite side, oh, it's still high, six, oh, because I'm leaking through the capacitor. <laughs> well, when I didn't have the capacitor here, it would bunch up on the bottom side and not much would show up on the top side here. But because I put the capacitor in parallel with the uh, inductor to show you all three types of loads, which I'm going to measure in a while and post it together with this thing, I have to make a name for the zip file that I'm going to put this in. Um, I haven't decided what it's going to be. It'll be in the description to this video once I decide what it's going to be. So I've got an inductive load, a cap, capacitive load, and a resistive load. Um, Actually, most of the current shows up here at the voltage source. It's uncanny. So that's why this should be a radio tuner and not a sine wave generator. Because you could use the tuning coil on this thing as your inductive load and any other capacitors or resistors in here. You'd have a wallop of energy if you can engineer it in such a manner that your radio tuner can handle the energy that's going to backwash into it. That's the ideal place to get most uh, to get your load. It's from the very s f source of your voltage. <laughs> Hope you know that that's stimulating this thing to operate. Um, let's see what else is there to say. I think that's it. So, oh, one thing I learned in the course of doing this, you know, it's very good to go through all the stages of doing what nobody wants because you learn how to um, make improvements. Now, where's my cursor? And so what I learned is that it's very auspicious to have a capacitor shorting out each of the four modules. So I have three capacitors shorting them out. And I don't think it really matters what the values are down here. I'm going to fool around with my capacitor values and my inductor values. Actually, I'm going to leave the inductor value where it is. I'm probably not going to change it. I'm going to keep it at one millihenry. Um, but I do want to change the capacitive values to see you know, how much does it matter? And I don't think it matters a whole lot. I mean, it, I'm sure it matters to a certain degree, and I'm sure there's lots of wiggle room because this is the area of the circuit we get to play with to see what kind of uh, uh, output results or what kind of result, <laughs> what kind of, what's the result? Um, so there's wiggle room for changes this thing. You know, you don't have to do it exactly the way I do it. And since I have less components now, you're free to do all kinds of things. Now, where's my cursor? So let's get a nice big view of this far away view. Uh, that's a little too far away. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So here, oh, I got back away now. So there's the circuit. So there's your two core modules. And there's one bookend module right here. And here's another bookend module. And notice that I have a spark gap in parallel with the capacitor on the two bookend modules as well as on the two core modules. So it is a, you don't have to have the spark gap on both top and bottom sides to get this thing to run. But if you're going to have it only on one side, I think you do have to have it all of them. All four modules have to has, has to have a spark gap in there to provide negative resistance in parallel with the... Um, uh, capacitor uh, in parallel with it. Um, now, you, there's nothing to stop you from having spark gaps on both sides, all eight spark gaps in here. Nothing, uh, nothing wrong with that. I don't know if it increases or diminishes your output gain, you know, the resulting uh, output but, or the resulting amount, I should say, because <laughs> these are not load outputs, so I, 
I have to watch myself here. Um, I forgot. It's been a while since I re cut the amount of spark gaps in half. I've been through so many versions by now that I can't remember. But it, there's a lot of wiggle room here. You know, there's some limitations that you have to st stay within certain parameter limits. And within those limits, you get to play with this and vary it to your heart's to content. Um, but this is a voltage buildup device. This is not a current buildup device. Unless you have bleed off to ground, you're not going to have current to speak of, um, to write home about. It's going to be all voltage and practically no current. So you have to artificially create a bleed to ground to, to have a place to put a load. And your load has to be off all of four modules. They cannot be inside the four modules. I already know this. You don't have to remind me. I've already been there and done that. So it has to be bleeding to ground is where you put your loads. And it just turns out in this case I put it the same place where I get my feed line feeding into this. So there are no switches here to worry about. Can you operate them fast enough? And so this is a whole lot more buildable. I hope I've satisfied your curiosity as to what is buildable. Um, this definitely is much more so, and when I get the finished circuit, you'll see how I've monkeyed with the capacitor values and the inducting values, and even the mutual coupling values. I'm going to see what I can get away with for the minimum takeoff to occur. Because this thing is like night and day. If you don't hit the tipping point, it just sits there in minuscule quantity of energy that just sits there and doesn't do anything interesting. But once you cross that line, it just blows up in your face with energy and... Um, that's what I look for when I look for minimums, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look for minimums of capacitances and inductances in these four modules to see what I can get away with. What's the minimum to hit the tipping point at that frequency? Um, let's see what else. And then the mutual inductance among the uh, coils of the transformers. Um, yeah, in a sense, these coils at the two bookends, I call them ballasts, ballast inductors. Because they're just here to there to help stabilize, and also the series capacitor in no, excuse me, the parallel capacitor here and here, they're just there to serve as ballast. They help stabilize the circuit and give it uh, a more robust behavior. Because you don't want something erratic, and or, and the other thing is I have to be careful about matrix and singular errors that microcap loves to throw in my face, and I suspect there's nothing wrong with that error message. In fact, I suspect that matrix is singular means that the circuit is overly stressed. And just like the simulator is overly stressed trying to figure out what to do to approximate, the circuit is going to be overly stressed in its own way. So I take errors seriously. I don't take them lightheartedly. If there's an error, I try to avoid it. And I don't try to complain that the simulator is being unfair, because I don't think it is. Microcap used to cost $5,000, and I don't think they're being unfair at all. So I try to stay within the limits because, well, if I get a matrix of singular error, the simulator stops dead cold and doesn't proceed further, and I don't get I don't get away with it. So I have no choice. I have to avoid that error. Um, and there's another error I have to avoid that's very similar. Uh, time step is too s small for transient analysis, and sometimes you'll oscillate between those two types of errors, which tells me they're pretty much the same error. Because it doesn't take much change in the circuit to get either one error or the other. Um, so I avoid both. They're both fatal. So I have to avoid both types of errors. And there's really no other error. Uh, I don't get a floating note error because I know. I've learned. The trick is you have only one um, uh, uh, path to ground. And if you want to, you can put a blocking capacitor there to make sure it's not a DC leakage to ground and microcap lets you get away with that. Um, and then if you have transformers, can, if you have isolated you know, areas, that are modular areas, that the only transference between them is through a transformer core, you can get away with it. Microcap will allow you not to ha require you to have, you know, uh, LT Spice will have you putting <laughs> grounds all over the place and then your circuit is, is not regulatable. I've done this analog computer um, version of amplification in LT Spice, and it's just not regulatable. In fact, I did a version that exploded in 1e e to the negative 100. No, excuse me, 1e e to the positive 100. No, no, 1e e to the negative 100 fraction of a second. 
That's how completely absurd it is to be required to put grounds everywhere. Because when I do a ground, I always put a capacitor, in LT Spice, I always put a capacitor there between the earth, or between ground and the circuit. And that disallows DC leakage, enhances AC buildup, and the whole thing just wants to explode. So you can't regulate it. It's absurd to try to do this in LT Spice. It just won't happen. But everybody loves LT Spice. Well, you can get microcap for free now. You don't have to pay $5,000. And you make it as big a circuit as you like and not have to deal with being forced to put in grounds, absurd quantity of grounds, when you know it's not necessary to do so. I know it's not necessary to do so. Just one is all you need. And I choose to put it on my source path, which now becomes my load path. So it takes care of everything in one one deal. All right, I think I've talked enough. And now I'm going to get off and finish working on this. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And I try, I'll try to be more forgiving. I can be pretty harsh with anybody who raises a criticism. But I guess it's only because I care so much that I overreact. It's, uh, and it's unfortunate that I, that I have a tendency of doing that. Um, maybe I'll soften up in time. or Maybe I'll be a crappy, grumpy old man uh, for the rest of my life. You know, maybe age has something to do with it. I can blame old age. I don't know, because I've lived through too much stress to uh, be a happy camper anymore. So I overreact to everything. Oh, well.